Okay. Um, hey, folks. So um, sorry for the for the somewhat minor technical delays. Um, yeah. So I'm David Ridge. Um, I am senior solutions consultant at PagerDuty. Um, and as such, um, I get to talk to a lot of different organizations, uh, different uh, customers and, and potential customers um, all over Australia, New Zealand and, and Southeast Asia. Um, and I really get to understand a lot of the problems that, that those organizations are having. Um, when it comes to operations, there's kind of a fundamental shift that's happening um, all around the world, really. Um, and it is moving towards a more kind of a service ownership, um, more of an agile DevOps SRE um, kind of way of working. And for a lot of you know newer born in the cloud organizations, um, that is uh, you know a great way of working. It, it requires um, or it allows great for great flexibility. Um, but for larger organizations where there's a lot of existing process and existing uh, infrastructure in place, a lot of on-premise stuff, it, it leads to sort of a hybrid, um, a hybrid environment whereby you know they want to do newer, more flexible, agile things, but there is still a lot of legacy systems going on. So when we talk about automating operations, we sort of have to take into account both um, both methods, both ways of working. Um, and so I guess one of the things I want to talk about today is how do we look at operations holistically um, and how do we allow for this level of scalability, this level of flexibility, you know, being able to use configuration as code, being able to use all the tools that are, are there, um, you know, in the marketplace these days, while also uh, maintaining the things like um, uh, you know, uh, compliance, uh, regulation, uh, having to raise tickets and things like that. So first, when we want to talk about automating operations, let's first look at the historical scope of operations where, you know, if we're going into organizations that, you know, larger banks or insurance places or telcos and, and things that have been around for, for decades, you traditionally have this kind of a model whereby there was an application that was sitting on some infrastructure, you might have had some monitoring for that, or maybe you didn't, and you just had people who called in saying that it didn't work. That raised tickets, and then there was a very structured, centralized way of dealing with that ticket, whereby the level one people decided whether it was an issue or not. Uh, if it was, they brought it to the level two people who tried to restart the box, and if it turns out that the problem was inside the box, then it went to level three, who are the people who knew what was inside the box. Um, that you know that still exists a lot to, to this day, and there's still that kind of linear. Uh, centralized way of working. But as we kind of all know uh, and love, there is, um, you know, operations has, has moved forward considerably. Um, the modern scope of operations is one of uh, what we call these Death Star architecture diagrams, whereby you have hundreds and hundreds of microservices owned by hundreds of engineers and developers, um, you know, all weaving uh, dependencies um, all over various different aspects of things. And so, you know, combining this with a level of uh, service ownership of a kind of build it, run it mentality means that not only do you have like distributed um, applications and networks, you also have distributed ownership of, um, you know, what well, basically the uptime and, and operation of the under or the overarching technology. You know, for example, Netflix is entirely dependent on. Uh, it's uptime. Uh, if, there, if Netflix is down, there is no Netflix, which used to be the case, you know, I guess for those older millennials like myself uh, who remember Netflix as a DVD company. Um, but, you know, it's now entirely uh, based on uptime, right? And so that decentralized um, ownership of that uptime is something that um, requires a fair bit of complexity and trust and, um, and organization in order to ensure that it runs smoothly. So how does PagerDuty help? Well, um, I guess for those who are unaware uh, or who have never heard of PagerDuty before, um, in short, I guess PagerDuty is a platform for real-time operation. It enables everyone across your business to manage urgent and mission critical unplanned work. And when I say unplanned work, it's such as the kind of events and alerts and incidents that are generally 
uh, generated by these kind of tools, right? Whether it is, you know, your classic IT operations, um, you know, let's raise a ticket because something has happened, whether it's more proactive in the kind of monitoring and observability world of your APM tools, et cetera, uh, whether it's coming directly from, from the cloud infrastructure that you have or the cloud products that you have, or even now with the cloud monitoring tools, the cloud native monitoring tools that are there, or whether it's actually, you know, and which we're seeing more and more of uh, from the CI/CD pipeline, right? Where, uh, for example, Netflix, uh, who are a PagerD customer, um, you know, staging has become as urgent as a, a production uh, issue. Production issues are basically something has severely gone wrong. If we if we're catching things in production, we should always catch them in staging. And so, therefore, there is real time response required for not just production environments, but maybe all the way down through. So, um, you know, the, the classic kind of flow of information coming from these monitoring tools and from these IT operations tools uh, can come into PagerDuty. And then as a result, you know, when we talk about operations, there is this entire flow of, of exactly what happens, not just about, you know, uh, understanding what is broken, but the actual process of then responding to that, that particular issue. Um, you know, at a very high level, to talk just about page duty quickly to put it in context, you know we can consume all the signals from those various different um, different monitoring tools, those events, those alerts, incidents, etc. And they don't always have to be bad things. They can be actually opportunities, right? There are a number of different use cases whereby you know there's a spike in sales, or we need to reroute marketing here and there. But um, being able to just understand while those uh, monitoring tools will tell will hold the the logic about whether something is wrong or not. PagerDuty can uh, understand the context of that and really control what do you want to do about that, right? So yes, CPU has gone over a certain uh, limit. Well, you know, do you need to be called in the middle of the night? Well, it depends, right? It depends on a number of different things. It depends on well, what service is it? What, what application are we talking about? What piece of infrastructure are we talking about? Uh, what environment is it? Um, what time is it, right? Like if it's during the day, then no, because we're all online. But maybe if it's 2 a.m., then yes, I do need a phone call. So being able to understand that context, or do I need to raise a human at all, right? Machine automation, maybe, why can't we just resolve it ourselves? Can we not just, you know, increase auto scaling or just, you know, destroy the instance and, and create a new one? Or maybe it's a combination of both. Maybe it's we'll try and automate it. And if that didn't work, then we'll escalate it to a human. So being able to control what you want to do about the fact that, you know, you're getting so these alarms, these metrics and alerts um, is kind of at the core of what PagerDuty does. Now, when we talk about automating a lot of that, um, you know, there's it. it introduces some level of com complexity, but also it introduces quite a lot of opportunity. Because if you take the kind of capabilities that are behind that diagram, we talk about, you know, ingestion. We're gonna, the, the, the practical nature of that is that we're going to have to try and consume all the different signals. So how are we going to get information from, let's say, CloudWatch into PagerDuty? Um, oftentimes that's by API, sometimes it's by email, depending on, on, you know, maybe if it's not CloudWatch, maybe it's some on-premise system like SCOM or Nagios or something like that. Um, and then we have to understand, you know, well, what does this signal represent? Who should it go to? Um, you know, and then what about that person? So what's their phone number? What's their mobile app? Uh, you know, what's their email address? What's their schedule? How often do they work? Who are their teammates? Um, and being able to understand a lot of that, as well as being able to scale that, right? Um, and then, okay, so we have all the stuff that happens before the phone call, which is, you know, who should this go to? Have we already raised an incident for this? And so we can correlate things together like that. Um, you know, uh, maybe we should suppress it because it's something that we don't really care about. Maybe it's just a warning. Maybe we'll wait and see if it automatically resolves itself before we uh, raise an incident. Um, maybe we need to raise an incident in, in, in service now. Let's spin up a JIRA ticket or something um, before we ever actually notify a person. And let's track everything that happens. So there's a lot of individual components and, and, and considerations when we do that. And they can be different from team to team. So as we mentioned, if we're decentralizing a lot of this, if we're pushing the ownership out to the, 
to the teams who are building it, who are now designed to run it. Um, you can have a lot of variance. You can, certain teams may only care about high profile things or they only want P1s and P2s or when the thing is on fire. Other teams may want to be alerted for not necessarily incidents, but like downward facing trends. So they want to be able to catch something before it ever becomes an incident, which obviously happens a lot more than actual incidents. And so therefore they need a way to understand the noise, right? And then, okay, so we have all that stuff that happens before the incident. We have notifying the right person. Then we have a bunch of stuff that happens uh, once that right person is awake, right? So whether that's mobilizing multiple people, whether that's um, you know being able to automatically remediate, uh, being able to track all of that that's going on. So a lot of configuration, very dependent, um, and also can be quite um, quite varying depending on the on the different services. And that's a lot of the reasons why we will see pushback on a lot of uh, you know newer ways of working from larger enterprises because they don't want to let go of that control because they're afraid that something like a P1 would be missed because the, you know it's the developers or whoever who are um, who are in control of that and they don't know what to do. So how do we overcome that? We overcome that by creating standard patterns. We overcome that by creating templates. And we overcome that by automating the configuration in to achieve an, like a baseline, right? That everyone can agree on. And so let me take you through a quick example. Um, in this, this is kind of a, a pretty linear example. So maybe taking one of those 500 microservices out of the Netflix or the Twitter uh, Death Star, and let's kind of just um, open it out for a second. What we have is we have, you know, maybe an application or a, a some kind of payment processor um, that's deployed on an EC2 instance. And then we have Phil. So Phil is our, uh, our uh, engineer, right? And so Phil is the person who wants to know, um, he's on call right now, and he wants to know when, or he's responsible for the, the payment processor. And so he wants to know when there are certain alarms that go wrong with the payment processor or the EC2 instance that are on it. So what Phil needs to do is he needs to create some of these alarms um, and make sure that they are currently monitoring uh, the particular instance. And when any of these happen, he wants to know. So what he'll need to do is also configure a service. Now, page duty, the service is basically the thing that you're having the incident on. It's the thing that you're monitoring. It basically represents the payment processor and you know, that entire stack that Phil is responsible for. Um, once that incident actually happens, or once that service is created, um, he wants it to go to his team, his uh, escalation policy. So this is an object inside PagerDuty that we talk about. And the escalation policy is basically uh, the payments team, the way in which it's almost like the contract of engagement. It's the way in which they want to be notified. So Phil is the primary on-call person. After five minutes, if he doesn't acknowledge the incident, it's going to go to the secondary responder. And then after 15 minutes, it's going to go to the manager. This is kind of a standard best practice escalation that we have uh, set out in PagerDuty. Now, if we had to do this for every single microservice, um, there could be a lot of variance and a lot of um, uh, inconsistencies, I guess, in, in the process. But because we can do all of this inside Terraform, it allows for um, the, an entire kind of end-to-end -end process of every time that we deploy something new, every time we you know, um, uh, release something, every time we deploy an EC2 instance that has something on it, what we can do is we can define basic standards, whether that is we must always have at least two alarms on every piece of infrastructure. It might be we also have to have some new relic alarms that are do, running synthetics through the payment processor, right? So of these five or six standard things, if you use our pipeline, if you use our platform, then you will, you know, we can guarantee that you're always monitoring these kind of five key metrics for any net new piece of infrastructure. We also can then set up standard structures, which means that it's not just going to go to a group email or it's not just going to go to a Slack channel. There are genuinely people who are on call who are going to get notified about their specific things and we're going to have backups and triages, right? Similarly, 
you know, there's a whole bunch of other um, capabilities that can be automated on deployment so that we can kind of um, copper fasten the operations around it. This gives, number one, it gives Phil and his team um, a platform for ensuring that they know exactly what's going on with their own services. Number two, for kind of larger scale organizations, it gives a, a, a sense of assurance for um, their ability to you know, understand at least what's going on and be able to enforce patterns and things like that. Um, of course, you know, if we talk about, if we look into the code of this, it's kind of just your standard um, Terraform code, right? So we have uh, PagerDuty has its own provider. And so when we talk about um, you know, provisioning the particular instance and provisioning the alarms, you know, we have a particular CPU alarm here, uh, pretty aggressive, um, but it has a particular um, action of an SNS topic. That SNS topic has a subscription that will send uh, the alarm directly to PagerDuty. And you'll see here that PagerDuty has a CloudWatch integration key. So if we pop over onto the other side to the payment processor, we'll talk about the PagerDuty service. We can define that as code, right? So every net new um, application can also have a corresponding service inside PagerDuty. Um, you have this CloudWatch integration that is assigned to that particular service for the payment processor. And so when we create this integration, that will give us the integration key that we'll provide back to CloudWatch. Um, once we raise an incident on the service, then we have an escalation policy that is that particular team. So we don't have to create an, a, the same, a new escalation policy every time. We can have the same escalation policy, the same group of people responsible for multiple services. And that gives huge amounts of granularity, visibility, and control to the engineers themselves that they can say, for payment processors, yes, I want really aggressive um, monitoring. I want really aggressive alarms because that's how we make money. But for you know maybe other systems that are a bit more flaky or a bit less urgent, maybe I want a different level of response. So you have this um, really interesting and powerful um, way of uh, controlling the different ways in which you respond to things, but you can do it as code. Um, you know, having that end-to-end -end piece, just being able to um, have it all in that, that single kind of pipeline, number one is very powerful for provisioning. But of course, when we talk about having to make updates to particular things, um, having that audit trail, having that ability to be able to make decisions, um, track people's changes, because of course, when we're talking about, you know, finding out if something is, is uh, you know, if something is down or something has a P1, we really want to, to, even for compliance reasons, we have to be able to understand, you know, who changed what, why that didn't work for both post-mortem reasons, as well as kind of, you know, self-improvement. So if we wanted to maybe change a particular time or even, you know, make techn technology decisions like, you know, we're not going to use New Relic anymore. Maybe we're going to use a different tool or maybe we're going to just use CloudWatch or maybe now the kind of DevOps guru internally or, you know, these kind of strategic decisions can be incredibly easily um, configured and as such, just create a new version of our monitoring suite. We can go back to the old one if we need to. We can kind of show how we've improved as well as control the various different aspects of it. So being able to automate this end-to-end -end operation from, um, from provision all the way through to provisioning alarms and then the thing that captures those alarms and how that actually gets directly to the person um, you know, is, is quite, a, quite a powerful um, solution. PagerDuty uh, is quite good at this um, because frankly, we API everything. Uh, we're kind of an API first type uh, organization whereby, you know, if, um, if we're building a capability, we'll ensure that there is an API there for it. These are just kind of a nice selection of the APIs that we have across various different aspects. And if we look at the Terraform coverage of a lot of that, um, it is substantial. A lot of the ones that aren't covered there are actually things like you know, uh, being able to, to edit and update an incident, uh, looking at people's um, abilities of a particular user, being able to pull analytics or who's on call, as well as, you know, being able to just send events directly to PagerDuty. There's one in particular that I want to touch on very quickly that kind of elevates 
this um, quite further. Now you saw in that last example, it was quite linear. It's like we have a single service, we have you know a single team. But you know, the reality of things is, as we saw, service dependencies is one of those things that you know is becoming quite evident. It's extremely evident when you look at all the different lines between this thing, right? And fundamentally, one of the problems that PagerDuty is is often tasked to solve, and one of the best ones is you know the problem statement from a developer or an engineer or somebody who's on call who says, I want you to tell me if my application is, is down or having issues, but I also want to tell you, tell, I want you to tell me that it's not my fault. I want you to tell me if it's the guy upstream from me or if it's a multiple event and not have me, you know, have to diagnose for 20 minutes to understand that it's actually not my thing. And so being able to understand the context and service dependencies, of course, we can do that in code, whereby this, that service that we talked about, that payment processor service, we can define various different things, right? So whether there uh, you know, are downstream, all of these different various processors and load balancers and thing roll into a larger online payments business group, but also that it has a supporting service. So it sits on the API platform. And so if the API platform is having an issue, that's something that I probably need to know because I'm in charge of one of those APIs how that actually represents when you configure it like that inside PagerDuty, um, it's kind of like this, basically. So we have our payment processor that I'm currently on call for, or that Beth is currently on call for here. And we can have a visualization that yes, while we're having our incident going on, there's also something upstream from us that's having a particular incident, right? You can get that kind of visualization. And this is you know, a decentralized model. So this is just for me and my team. Um, and, and so we can, we can have configure that directly to how we want it. Uh, similarly, when we're actually during an incident, um, we can have the concept of technical service dependency. So while yes, you are having an incident, you should probably know that the thing upstream from you is also having an incident. It can't connect to host, as well as you know there are related incidents going on. So not only are you in the payment processor API, but also the login API and the shopping cart API are also having very similar issues. So maybe it's not your fault. With PagerDuty being able to configure as code on deployment, um, you know how all of these um, applications, how all these microservices or whatever they might be, are linked together, gives responders huge amount of context. It gives them instant context so that they don't have to waste time, you know, going down uh, a dead end. And it also provides a lot of uh, value to the wider organization because at least they know that you are um, implementing uh, their standards. Last thing I just want to touch on is the PagerDuty provider. So myself and a number of my colleagues at PagerDuty, we are active contributors to the PagerDuty provider. So every time something new gets released, um, it is starting to become a, um, a requirement for release that, uh, you know, do we have the PagerDuty, do we have the provider um, in place, do we are we adding this to the provider in the near term, et cetera. So we are keeping it very much up to date. So it has a lot of the cooler stuff in it. Um, and just, you know, I guess to, to just reinforce some of some of the reasons why we can look beyond just infrastructure as code and, and provisioning things into provisioning the support around those things, right? You can manage that configuration at scale. Um, it means that you don't have to go back around and remember or, and try and figure out what you have coverage for and what you don't. Um, and so it can also enforce those reviews and permissions um, to ensure that you have that high quality and those best practices. It can also ensure that you have compliance for new features, right? So any net new thing that gets released on this platform is automatically compliant and you don't have to worry about it because you inherited a lot of that stuff and it allows you to provision complex interdependent yeah. environments. Um, that's pretty much all I have for um, from a PagerDuty perspective. Um, please check us out if you want to know more about PagerDuty or you just want to know more about the, the how you can configure um, Terraform using PagerDuty and in your ecosystem, um, please hit me up um, or reach out to anyone in PagerDuty.